So I'm a professor of electrical engineering, as I said, but I'm not going to talk uh, directly about electrical engineering. I'm going to talk about health. We've talked about health a lot at Davos. I'm going to talk about machine intelligence health. This graph is really the reason for Obamacare in many ways. The fact that spending on healthcare has outgrown uh, growth in GDP for the last 50 years, year on year. And that's because we all live older. But a lot of us, as we live older, we contract diabetes, heart failure, um, COPD, a respiratory condition, or hypertension, high blood pressure. 20 years ago, we started an experiment called telehealth, which is to send the patient out of the hospital, out of GP surgery, and give them the tools at home to become uh, expert patients, um, make the measurements, and try and manage their condition. That experiment has failed. We're restarting now with digital health, which has machine intelligence. We bring the doctor into the home to help give evidence-based advice and to help people manage their readings. In this case, their blood pressure, maybe their oxygen levels, their weight, and understand what it means, interpret the readings through machine intelligence. The patient also, we view him or her completely different. The patient is no longer the problem. The patient is part of the solution. So it's very important at the outset to involve the patient in the design of these digital health apps. So here's one of our focus groups in Oxford where we involve patients, in this case, with heart failure in designing our app for heart failure. And when you start using the app, the first question is the question you get if you're in the GP surgery. The GP would ask you, how are you feeling today? And instead of a GP answering, all of this goes into our software, which interprets the answers given by the patients when they use the app. Uh, they use it not only, of course, to answer questions about their symptoms and how they're feeling, but also to make measurements. Now, that can be quite complicated. One of the reasons telehealth failed, it's hard for a 70-year-old to use a blood pressure device or a pulse oximeter, this device that measures your oxygen. So we give them some support through machine intelligence, again, to help them do the readings. Machine intelligence also tracks what is happening to the patient day by day. Here you can see the variability. It happens to be heart rate and oxygen levels in a patient with respiratory disease. You can't really spot the abnormal readings. The machine can, using a personalized model of that particular patient, and provide feedback to the patient to make sure it doesn't get any worse. And that feedback is in the form of multimedia content towards which the patient is guided. For example, if they need to use their inhaler and they haven't used it for three or four months, there's a little video to help them to improve their breathing, their exercise, also their emotional well-being, because very often we pick up depression in these people as a result of their long-term condition. And this picture is a paradox. We find that our patients have no problems using our digital health technology, but what they do like is a video selected by the machine to be a video recorded by their respiratory nurse their heart failure nurse. That connection is very important to them and it's something we have to think about in terms of the man-machine interaction. It also allows you to build a digital community. Patients like me in the US has been hugely successful. This site here is for epilepsy. We have these sites, these forums for our patients and they share data, they share experiences, they share tips on how to manage their diabetes or their high blood pressure. It's not just for the developed world. We're using exactly the same Android tablets in India, working with ashes. These women with six years education only, including primary school, and who've had tremendous impact on maternal health and child health, and now are starting to look at uh, chronic disease. Here, the management of a lady who may have a, a stroke or a heart attack in the near future. Where are we going with this? Well, the one missing element at the moment we still require the patient to make the measurement once a day or so. How about continuous measurement? And we are working with universities in the UK and the US and companies to use these digital plasters which monitor your vital signs for seven days and, and transmit the information to Bluetooth phone. Our approach in Oxford is slightly different. We use the webcam circled here actually to measure the light reflected from a patient's face and from that work out their heart rate, their breathing rate, their oxygen levels, their blood pressure. Here developed originally in the hospital in the Oxford Kidney Unit. But we're moving into the home, and this is a video of one of my research students. The top two values, 78, 26, are from a probe on the finger for the heart rate, and he's breathing like a metronome. We're getting him to hyperventilate, breathing at 26 breaths per second. What the camera tells you is heart rate of 75, breathing rate of 26. It's absolutely perfect. 
And this is the vision of the future. A grandmother Skyping her grandchild. She's got a laptop, he's got a webcam. At the top, you can see just the respiratory cycle, three breaths, three oscillations in 15 seconds. At the bottom, the cardiac cycle. So while she's Skype, Skyping her grandchild, we're getting a complete cardiorespiratory profile of that person. Seamless digital health for the aging population. Thank you.